Let failure be your friend. There are going to be times, of course, where you're going to win a lot. A lot of things are going to go your way. And it's wonderful to bask in that adulation and to feel proud of your successes. But there are also going to be times, the satisfaction that those moments bring, nothing can compare to that. Those victories will feed you for years to come and help you stay committed when your tank is sometimes empty. Winning is great. It's fantastic. I love it. I love being number one. I love winning. But it's the times when things go wrong, when you fall or fail, that you're actually gone, going to learn the most about yourself. You know, all those years on the Oprah show, 25 years, we were the number one show for 25 years. And that's because I lived with the intention to serve the audience. The audience came first every show. I would sit with the producers and say, well, I can't do that because I can't find the truth of myself in that show. I have to have a thread of truth to be able to hold on to. So I knew so well the audience. I felt like I was the audience, the audience um, was me and I felt so connected. And then I ended that and started a new network. And I flailed for a while and I was really upset with myself. But I will tell you that when I was able to shift the paradigm to start to looking at, wow, what I have instead of what I don't have, what I have instead of what I thought I'd lost, I was able to begin to turn things around. But it's those moments of being of uncertainty. It's the moments where, you know, all of my mistakes show up on the evening news. You can make a mistake. I can tell if I've done something wrong. It's on the CNN crawl. I can read about it. But learning from the moments where things weren't going so great, being able to get still, to connect with that which I know is God, the force, the power greater than myself, and to come back and realize that in order to move forward, you move forward by taking the next right step. You don't have to know everything to do. You don't have to know all the steps to make. Just what is the next right move? It's a big, hard world out there, but you're ready for it. And you're ready because there is nothing more powerful than you using your personality to serve the calling of your soul. Every one of us has been called to the planet to use, and in this moment, in this political moment where everybody is just hysterical, in this moment, the call is for whatever side you choose to be on, to use more of you to bring forth the light. And to do that, you've got to have clarity about who you really are. There is no life without a spiritual life. There is no life without understanding what Pierre de Chardin, the philosopher and mystic said, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So your real job as you go out to try to find one and have all of this anxiety and fear and your real job is to know the truth and to create a spiritual practice that allows you to stay in it. To be clear, I'm not talking about your religion. I'm talking about whatever it is that nurtures the essence of you in such a way that you can do what you came here to do. And one of the reasons why I was able to be so successful all those years on The Oprah Show is because I understood there was really no difference between me and the audience. I was a surrogate for the audience because I know that the audience and you and you and you want the same thing I do. We all want to be able to live out the truest expression, the fullest, purest expression of ourselves as human beings. That's what you want. And in order to do that, 
You've got to practice, you've got to develop that spiritual muscle that allows you to check in with yourself and not have to ask everybody else about a decision, but to have the clarity of your own knowing, the comfort of your own knowing. And to do that, you've got to live in the space of gratitude. That is my number one spiritual practice. I practice being grateful. And a lot of people say, oh, Oprah, that's easy for you because you got everything. I got everything because I practiced being grateful. I ran across this beautiful quote the other day. I can't even remember who it was from that said, do not waste your time desiring what other people have. Remember the things that you now have are things you once only hoped for. So I live in that space every day of practicing gratitude because I know that being grateful wherever you are, whatever place or space in your life, being grateful changes your personal vibration. I was just having a conversation with Sheryl Sandberg the other day about her book Option B and we all know she lost her beloved husband David and I said, how did you get through it? And she said, by practicing gratitude. I didn't believe it at first, but I started to write down three things every day that I was grateful for. I said, oh, I've been doing that for years. Because when you wake up in the morning, looking at the world for what you're gonna write down or what you're gonna state to yourself by the end of the day that you're grateful for, you have a different outlook on life. I'm just waiting on somebody to hold the door, see if that makes the list. Some days you only have, I'm still breathing. Because life gets in the way sometimes. But practicing gratitude as a spiritual practice to evolve you, to bring you closer to the truth of knowing who you really are, is one of the most valuable things I have ever, ever experienced. And I do it. I have journals and journals and journals and journals filled with five things a day. If you don't believe me, just for a moment, do this. Close your eyes, everybody in here. We're gonna do this for five seconds. You're gonna inhale, and on the exhale, just say, thank you. Inhale. Exhale. Do it one more time. Let the, whatever you're most grateful for in your heart in this moment just rise to the surface. Deep breath. Thank you. Open your eyes. Don't you feel better? You feel better. Researchers have shown that if you can just for 17 seconds a day, 17 seconds a day, bring yourself into the space of presence and gratitude, you literally change your vibration. If you can't give yourself 17 seconds, then you don't deserve a good life. You can't give yourself 17 seconds to breathe and say thank you, then just let whatever happens, happens to you. In 1964, I was a little girl sitting on the linoleum floor of my mother's house in Milwaukee, watching Anne Bancroft present the Oscar for Best Actor at the 36th Academy Awards. She opened the envelope and said five words that literally made history. The winner is Sidney Poitier. Up to the stage came the most elegant man I had ever seen. I remember his tie was white and of course his skin was black and I'd never seen a black man being celebrated like that. And I have tried many, many, many times to explain what a moment like that means to a little girl, a kid watching from the cheap seats as my mom came through the door, bone tired from cleaning other people's houses. But all I can do is quote and say that the explanation in Sydney's performance in Lilies of the Phil, amen, amen. What I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. And I'm especially proud and inspired by all the women 
who have felt strong enough and empowered enough to speak up and share their personal stories. Each of us in this room are celebrated because of the stories that we tell. But it's not just a story affecting the entertainment industry. It's one that transcends any culture, geography, race, religion, politics, or workplace. So I want tonight to express gratitude to all the women who have endured years of abuse and assault because they, like my mother, had children to feed and bills to pay and dreams to pursue. They, they, they're the women whose names we'll never know. They are domestic workers and farm workers. They are working in factories and they work in restaurants and they're in academia and engineering and medicine and science. They're part of the world of tech and politics and business. There are athletes in the Olympics and there are soldiers in the military. And there's someone else, Reese Taylor. A name I know and I think you should know too. In 1944, Reese Taylor was a young wife and a mother. She was just walking home from a church service. She attended in Abbeville, Alabama, when she was abducted by six armed white men, raped and left blindfolded by the side of the road, coming home from church. They threatened to kill her if she ever told anyone. But her story was reported to the NAACP where a young worker by the name of Rosa Parks became the lead investigator on her case. And together, they sought justice. But justice wasn't an option in the era of Jim Crow. The men who tried to destroy her were never persecuted. Reese Taylor died 10 days ago, just shy of her 98th birthday. She lived as we all have lived too many years in a culture broken by brutally powerful men. For too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dared to speak their truth to the power of those men. But their time is up. In my career, what I've always tried my best to do, whether on television or through film, is to say something about how men and women really behave, to say how we experience shame, how we love and how we rage, how we fail, how we retreat, persevere, and how we overcome. And I've interviewed and portrayed people who've withstood some of the ugliest things life can throw at you, but the one quality all of them seem to share is an ability to maintain hope for a brighter morning, even during our darkest nights. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. And when that new day finally dawns, my life is fueled by my being and the being fuels the doing. So I come from a centered place. I come from a focused place. I come from compassion. It's just, it's just my nature. I come from a willingness to understand and to be understood. And I come from wanting to, to connect. I mean, the secret of that show for 25 years is that people could see themselves in me all over the world they could see themselves in me. And even as I became more and more financially successful, which was a big surprise to me, I was like, oh my God, this is so exciting. <laughs> so, but what, what I realized is through the whole process, because I'm grounded in my own self, that although I could have more shoes, my feet stayed on the ground, although I was wearing better shoes. These are kind of cute today too. <laughs> Uh, so I could keep my feet on the ground even though I could get more shoes. And I could understand, I could understand that it really was because I was grounded. I've, I've done the, was doing and continue to this day to do the consciousness work 
I work at staying awake. And being awakened is just another word for spirituality, but spirituality throws people off and they think you mean religion. When I was hiring people for my company, for own, uh, for looking for presidents, uh, when people would come in, I'd say, tell me, what is your spiritual practice? And literally would throw up people, oh, no, well, the, I, well, I'm not religious. Or I said, I didn't ask you about your right. religion. I asked you, what's your spiritual practice? What do you do to take care of yourself? What do you do to keep yourself centered? What do you do to the, and, uh, you know, one woman started crying. You know, that's not the person. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a sign. <laughs> that's a sign. So, so to answer your question, yeah. everything is fueled that comes from me really wanting to be a better person on earth. And this is what I know to be true. The reason why the show worked is because I understood that that audience, my viewers, the people who watched us every day and would come and just like you all did, uh, get tickets and they would come with their family. You all just came across campus, but that's good too. But, <laughs> but people would come from all over the world just to be there with their aunts and their mothers and they'd come with their cousins and there'd be a few men in there going, what the hell? <laughs> or saying, well, I went to Oprah with you. I went to Oprah. <laughs> Oh, at least give me clear for three or four weeks. I went to Oprah with you. <laughs> I had such regard for that. And I just had a conversation with John Mackey, who runs Whole Foods yeah. and has written this fabulous book. You should get it called um, Conscious Capitalism. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how the investment in the stakeholders, the people who you are serving, that connection between the people who you're trying to serve and sell to, is equally as important as the people who you're buying from, right. equally as important as the people who are, you know, supporting you financially, as your stockholders if you are, you know, you know, a public company. So I always understood that there really was no difference between me and the audience. At times I might have had better shoes, but at the core, the core of, of, of what really matters, that we are the same. And you know how I know that? Because all of us are seeking the same thing. You're here at this fabulous school and we'll go out into the world and each pursue based upon what you believe your talents are, what your skills are, maybe your gifts are, but you're seeking the same thing. Everybody wants to fulfill the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. That's what you're looking for, the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. And because I understand that, I understand that if you're working in a bakery and that's where you want to be, and that may be the, that may be what you've always wanted to do is to bake pies for people or bake cakes for people or to offer your gift, then, then that's, that's for you. And there's no difference between you and me, except that's how, that's your platform. Mm -hmm. That's your show every day. So my understanding of that has allowed me to, to, to reach everyone. And, and there's no way that you wouldn't because that's, that's what I truly feel. Nobody's journey is seamless or smooth. We all stumble, we all have setbacks. If things go wrong, you hit a dead end as you will. It's just life's way of saying, time to change course. So ask every failure, this is what I do. Every failure, every crisis, every difficult time, I say, what is this here to teach me? And as soon as you get the lesson, you get to move on. If you really get the lesson, you pass and you don't have to repeat the class. If you don't get the lesson, it shows up wearing another pair of pants or skirt to give you some remedial work. And what I found is that difficulties come when you don't pay attention to life's whisper because life always whispers to you first, first, and if you ignore the whisper sooner or later, you'll get a scream. Whatever you resist persists, but if you ask the right question, not why is this happening, but what is this here to teach me? What is this here to teach me? It puts you in the place and space to get the lesson you need. My friend Eckhart Tolle, uh, who's written this wonderful book uh, called A New Earth, 
It's all about letting the awareness of who you are stimulate everything that you do. He puts it like this. He says, don't react against a bad situation. Merge with that situation instead. And the solution will arise from the challenge. Because surrendering yourself doesn't mean giving up. It means acting with responsibility. Okay. Many of you know that, as President Hennessy said, I started this school in Africa. And I founded the school where I'm trying to give South African girls a shot at a future like yours. And I spent five years making sure that school would be as beautiful as the students. I wanted every girl to feel her worth reflected in her surroundings. So I checked every blueprint, I picked every pillow, I was looking at the grout in between the bricks, I knew every thread count of the sheets, I chose every girl from the villages, from nine provinces, and yet last fall I was faced with a crisis I'd never anticipated. I was told that one of the dorm matrons was suspected of sexual abuse. Well, that was, as you can imagine, devastating news. First I cried, actually I sobbed for about a half an hour, and then I said, let's get to it. That's all you get is a half an hour. You need to focus on the now, what you need to do now. So I contacted a child trauma specialist, I put together a team of investigators, I made sure the girls had counseling and support, and Gail and I got on a plane and flew to South Africa. And the whole time I kept asking that question, what is this here to teach me? And as difficult as that experience has been, I got a lot of lessons. I understand now the mistakes I made because I had been paying attention to all of the wrong things. I built that school from the outside in when what really mattered was the inside out. So it's a lesson that applies to all of our lives as a whole. What matters most is what's inside. What matters most is the sense of integrity, of quality and beauty. I got that lesson. And what I know is, is that the girls came away with something too. They've emerged from this more resilient and knowing that their voices have power. Having compassion for other people is at the top of that list. I would say commitment is at the top of that list and also a spirit of constructive engagement. And by compassion, I don't just mean sympathy. It certainly isn't pity. It's being present and it's also feeling with other beings. You know, during the years of the Oprah show, I interviewed over 37,000 people one-on-one. -on -one. But during all those years of talking to over 37,000 people one-on-one, -on -one, I could feel what they were feeling so strongly. Sometimes it made me sick, literally. So I had to learn how to feel how others were feeling, feel with others, which it is, which is what it means to be compassionate, to feel with others without taking in all of their stuff. Being compassionate means I feel with you. It is one of the greatest qualities in the world to have if you're going to be majoring in what it takes to be a great human being. I feel with you means I not only am willing to walk in your shoes, it means my heart beats with yours. It means I see myself in you. It means I may not have shared that circumstance, but I know what heartbreak feels like. I know what pain feels like, and all pain is the same. It means I can feel your will to want to do better and be better. And I feel and I am with you. In spite of everything that's happened to you, I feel your need to rise. I want to help you rise. I want to rise with you. So many people are worried about building a brand. I hear kids on social media talking about their brand. And I used to really resent the word when people would say to me, oh, you have this brand, because I never, never even thought about a brand. I just thought about day in and day out making the best right choice for me. But now I embrace it because I recognize people see me as a brand. But for me, it's not a business. It is a question of what do you stand for? And I will say this, you're nothing if you're not the truth. So I have made, I've made a living, 
I've made a living, I've made a life, I've made a fortune, really, it's fantastic. <laughs> All good from being true to myself. And, and that's the, if I could leave you with any message today, that is it. Uh, the biggest reward is not financial benefits, though it's really good, you can get a lot of great shoes. But those of you who have a lot of shoes know that having great shoes and a closet full of shoes or cars or houses or square footage doesn't fill up your life. It doesn't. But living a life of substance can. Substance through your service, your offering of your whole self. And the baseline for how do you live a life of substance is whatever is the truth for you. What do you stand for? I think some people think that, are under the impression that I was born empowered, that I was born uh, coming out of the womb, ready to interview a Klansman. <laughs> then cut to commercial, we'll be right back. But the truth is, I know very well what it's like to be marginalized, to be told either subtly or quite directly that my contribution isn't or wasn't welcome, that my face was invisible, and that my needs were an affront. So back when I was doing the news in Baltimore, I asked to be paid the same as my co-anchor, who did exactly the same job as I was doing. And I expected that I would be compensated. So I went in and I asked that I would get the same amount of money. So he was doing the same job I was doing, except that he called me babe all the time. Babe. Yeah, babe. Anyway, I was told by my news director and by the general manager, because first I went to the news director, then I went to general manager, and I was told that because I was a single woman who didn't have a mortgage and I didn't have kids, that I was not entitled to earn the same kind of money as the man who was sitting next to me doing the same thing. And I realized in that moment that my employers did not get it. They did not understand my value. But you know what? I did. So cut to AM Chicago. The team's hard at work, and they had been working for a long time. And after a year or so, we were asked to be syndicated. That work began to pay off. And before long, we were now no longer called AM Chicago. We're the national Oprah Winfrey show. I got a raise, but my producers did not. So I went into the boss at the time, and I asked that my producers, who incidentally were all female, I asked that they would be given a pay raise increase. And my boss, this is 1986, said, why? They're only girls. What do they need more money for? Girls. Uh, I've used the word affectionately sometimes, referring to women as girls, and there was no affection in his tone. It was absolutely condescending. So, you know, it takes a while to develop a voice, but once you have it, you damn sure better use it on stuff that matters. So I took a deep breath in that moment and said, either they're going to get raises or I'm going to sit down. I'm not going to work if they don't get paid more, babe. Now, I would like to believe that I could have spoken that kind of truth to misogyny, even if I'd been all by myself. But here I was on the brink of finally getting what I really wanted and had been working uh, many years for, a national show. I mean, I might have been too intimidated to stand my own ground against this guy if I were actually alone. But here's the thing, you're never alone. You're never alone. The sovereign sound of Maya Angelou's voice was pushing me forward that day, whispering, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. So when I was faced with the opportunity to advocate for my producers, I silently called on some of the 10,000 and walked into my boss's office, hand in spirit, with the women who had come before me. I could feel Bessie Smith and Billie Holiday, and Ella Fitzgerald, and Pearl Bailey, and Sarah Vaughn, and Lena Horne clutching their green books looking for a place to eat while they sang in supper clubs for whites only. And I could feel 
Reese Taylor and Rosa Parks refusing to relinquish their dignity in the face of death threats. All these women were with me that day walking into the office in Chicago, as was Diana Carroll and Petula Clark and Joan Baez and Mary Tyler Moore and Moms Mabley and Barbara Walters and all of the astonishing women whose names none of us will ever even know despite their sacrifice. And I'm pretty sure I even heard Shirley Chisholm urging me on with this thought. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And I understood, I understood that there were so many times that many women from my mother's generation and God knows my grandmother's generation who were forced to grit their teeth and just take it because standing up for themselves wasn't even an option. The risk was too great and they knew it. But they also knew in their bones what my dear friend Maya put so eloquently into words when she says, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Because these women and so many others like them made the decision not to allow themselves to be reduced by the many injustices they were subjected to, I found the strength to act, if not just for myself, not just for my producers, but for all the women who in their ingenious ways subverted the rules, laid the foundation, and pushed the envelope just a little bit further for me.